Where are we in 2018? Um, basically, I'm going to kind of review a little bit um, before I get into some of the new designs, um, just a little background on the data to support or perhaps not support IVC filter placement, what the trends in IVC filter utilization have been up to this point, um, what the guidelines are, and then uh, touch on designs. Obviously, these are going to be delved into more deeply by Daniela, so I'm just going to uh, quickly go through them. So this is uh, the prepick study that um, kind of laid the foundation for um, recommendations for IVC filter pla placement in patients who couldn't receive anticoagulation. Um, this was in 1998 with permanent filters, and then subsequently they uh, reviewed with retrievable filters, and um, one of the endpoints showing uh, that there was a difference in pulmonary embolism rates with patients who had filter placement versus uh, no filter placed. Um, in contrast, deep venous, venous thrombosis was actually higher in patients with filter placement versus no filter, um, and there was no survival uh, difference between the two groups. So what's important to note in this study um, is that the control group received anticoagulation, but also the uh, group that received filters received anticoagulation. So we're basing our rec you know, recommendations on filter placement in patients who typically can't receive anticoagulation, but this study actually, those patients did receive anticoagulation on top of their filter. Um, and so that led then to um, Preserve Trial, which has just closed in April. It has over 2,000 patients. It has multiple, I think about 10 FDA-approved uh, devices in it, and this hopefully will shed some light as a prospective study on um, uh, efficacy of uh, filters. And so in 2003, um, a lot of uh, you know, the retrievable filters hit the market. And uh, with limited data around them, um, there was sort of a large uptick in their utilization and placement. Um, there's variation in their design. Some are, you know, like the option filter is a single cut nitinol. Um, and so you can see that there's likely going to be variation in how they fail when they fail um, based on their design. And kind of having an understanding of that is probably important for centers that uh, perform retrieval. But what is the data? So at that time, lack of recognized complications. There was lack of rigorous clinical trials um, prior to the FDA approval. And there was a culture of products as commodities. So these were you know, flying off the shelves like hotcakes going into patients that couldn't receive anticoagulation and then potentially other um, weaker indications. And so the utilization rises. Um, and so in 2010, after um, numerous submissions of uh, safety issues with retrievable filters, uh, the FDA issues a safety communication, and um, they place the responsibility of the filter retrieval on the physician who implanted it. Um, and then in 2014, they revise it again and recommend that retrieval should occur um, in less than 60 days after placement. And so we've seen all of us who place filters, retrieve filters, have seen images like this of complications related to strut migration, uh, fracturing, um, you know, flying into pulmonary artery, et cetera, et cetera, DVT uh, development, and uh, bedding causing difficult retrieval. And so numerous studies uh, showed, you know, that all the retrieval well, filters essentially had risks of these uh, complications, the select filter, option filter, um, all these trials came out to Nali looking at uh, these complications. And clearly there are real life-threatening issues that go with placing these filters in patients and having them um, go unfollowed uh, without any plan for retrieval. Um, in this study um, of the recovery filter, barred recovery, 40% fracture rate at five and a half years. So if you have a patient who just, you know, has this placed in the setting of not being able to receive anticoagulation um, and they are left, you know, for multiple years on their own, there is a true risk of uh, having a complication from, from placement. And so at this time, you know, uh, utilization starts to decline. Obviously, there's a litigious environment going on that's promoting uh, maybe a little bit more conscientious use of filters, and retrie retrieval rates increase, and all the techniques start to be 
uh, more robust in terms of retrieving both permanent and uh, retrievable filters that have either migrated struts and uh, other complications associated with them. And uh, retrieval rates increase in the Medicare population uh, when they studied it between 2012 and 2016. So what are the recommendations? And again, I'm sure Danielle will go in depth into this. My main point was that there are a lot of different societies that make recommendations and really the main one they can agree on is that in the setting of acute PE and a contraindication to anticoagulation, IVC filter placement is warranted. Um, but they should come out when the contraindication uh, is relieved. And you know the patient should continue to be periodically evaluated to see whether they still need their filter. Um, same thing from chest. Uh, and these are uh, grade 1B level evidence. Uh, essentially the same thing from the European Society of Cardiology. And then this is, I thought, a nifty chart um, just showing sort of all the society recommendations and comments and as well as their opposition. And again, really, the societies all kind of agree that um, inability to anticoagulate should be an indication. But after that, there should be some a more in-depth discussion, really, with both the patient, if they can have it, and the family about the filter uh, that they're having placed and whether it's, it's truly indicated. And so we segue into newer devices. So we have temporary filters, the ANGEL catheter, which is FDA approved in the US and Europe, um, which is actually physically attached uh, to a central venous catheter and can be um, temporarily implanted as a central venous catheter and remain in place for 30 days, through which you can receive contrast and other transfusions um, in the ICU setting, essentially. Um, so more detail on the catheter as far as um, efficacy evidence. They looked at 163 critically ill patients, um, patients who majority couldn't receive anti anticoagulation. 7% um, developed um, DVT uh, or worsening of their DVT during the course of the having the placement and there was also IVC uh, thrombus formation in about 8% of patients. Um, and then we move on to convertible filters. So this is filters that have a ch change in configuration over time to a non-filter design. Um, both of the ones here, Sentry and Venatec, leave something behind in the patient. So it's a filter, and then it um, can either be manually converted, as in the Venatec's case, into an uh, IVC stent, um, or in the uh, Sentry um, case, there's a bioabsorbable filament that will degrade over time, typically around 60 days, and it'll self-expand into a um, vena cava stent. So again, all these in the, both these cases, you're leaving something in a patient that may really not have an indication for a stent, and anything you leave in a patient, there's probably going to be problems at some point down the line, potentially, so important to think about as we um, have more studies on, on both these designs. So two-year results, pretty promising, 85 patients who had the majority were placed for um, uh, contraindication to anticoagulation. The vast majority converted, so some didn't convert. Uh, that's to note as well over the two-year time period. But there was no filter tilt migration, fracture, IVC perforation. Um, there was no new pulmonary embolism instances, and there were two symptomatic cable thromboses in, I believe, the first uh, month. And then the Venatech actually requires the operator to go back in and unhook the filter in order to have it spring open into the filter, uh, into the stent design. Um, it's based on a permanent filter design, so that stent is not coming out, or should the plan is for it not to come out. Um, and they reviewed it with a prospective single arm study of 150 patients at multiple sites. Um, and there was a 93% tactical conversion success rate. So there are clearly some people who are not able to convert this. Um, and then the question is how easy is it to retrieve if you can't? Um, and the mean conversion was at 130 days. Again, these are unplannable. If the patient's lost a follow-up with a retrievable filter in, are they gonna, they're going to be lost to follow-up with this uh, device in as well. There were some worrisome device-related adverse events. There was one migration within seven days to the right atrium. Um, so those are points to continue to watch. So in summary, they're not commodities retrievable filters. They all have uh, different characteristics based on their design and may fail in different ways. And having knowledge about that if you're retrieving them is important. Um, they're likely still overutilized, um, and retrieval rates remain low. 
surveillance is still lacking. And so if you're placing filters in patients, you should really be making an, a very concerted effort to follow these patients out. And again, of course, we need more data. How do these new devices, the um, convertible and retrievable, uh, rather the temporary filters, uh, fit into this picture? We don't have any comparative data. Thanks. Great. Thank you.